The, uh, when you think about resilience and technology, it's actually much easier. You're going to see some other speakers today, I, I already know, who are going to talk about breaking bones stuff. And uh, of course, with technology, it never is. So it's very easy, it, comparatively speaking, to be resilient. But I think it's also, if we look at what happened in the internet, it was such an incredible last you know, half a dozen years that it's hard to even get the right analogy for it. And a lot of how we decide how we're supposed to react to things and what we're supposed to expect about the future depends on what kind of how we bucket things and how we categorize them. And so I think the tempting analogy for the boom bust that we just went through with the internet is a gold rush. You know, it's easy to, to think of this analogy very different from some of the other things you might pick. For one thing, both were very real. They took, in 1849, in that gold rush, they took over $700 million worth of gold out of California. It was very real. Uh, the internet was also very real. This is a real way for humans to communicate with each other. It's a big deal. Huge boom, huge boom, huge bust. You keep going, and it, both things, there were lots of hype. I don't have to remind you of the, all the hype that was involved in the internet, the getrich.com, but you had the same thing with the gold rush. Gold, gold, gold. 68 rich men on the steamer Portland. Stacks of yellow metal. Some have 5,000, many have more. A few bring out $100,000 each. And people would get very excited about this when they read these articles. The El Dorado of the United States of America, the discovery of inexhaustible gold mines in California. And the parallels to the gold rush and the internet rush continue very strongly. So many people left what they were doing. What would happen is, and this went in the gold rush, it went on for years. People on the East Coast in 1849, when they kind of first start to get the news, they think, ah, oh, this isn't real. And, but they keep hearing about people getting rich. And then in 1850, they still hear that and they think it's not real. By about 1852, they're thinking, am I the stupidest person on earth? by not rushing to California, and they start to decide they are. These were community affairs, by the way. Local communities on the East Coast would get together and whole teams of 10, 20 people would, would caravan across the United States and they would form companies. These were typically not solitary efforts. But no matter what, if you were a lawyer or a banker, uh, people dropped what they were doing, no matter what skill set they had, to go pan for gold. Uh, this guy on the left, Dr. Richard Beverly Cole, he lived in Philadelphia, and he took the uh, Panama route. They'd take a ship down to Panama, cross the isthmus, and then take another ship north. Uh, this guy, Dr. Toland, went by covered wagon to California. This has its uh, parallels too, doctors leaving their practices. These were both very successful, physician in one case, surgeon in the other. Same thing happened on the internet. You get drcoop.com. In the gold rush, people literally jumped ship. The San Francisco Harbor was clogged with 600 ships at the peak because the ships would get there and the crews would abandon to go search for gold. So there were literally 600 captains and 600 ships. They turned the ships into hotels because they couldn't sail them anywhere. You had dot-com fever and you had gold fever. And you saw some of the excesses that, that the dot-com fever uh, created, and the same thing happened. The fort in San Francisco at the time had about 1,300 soldiers. Half of them deserted to go look for gold. And uh, they wouldn't let the other half out to go look for the first half, because they were afraid they wouldn't come back. And one of the soldiers wrote home, and this is the sentence that he put, the struggle between right and $6 a month and wrong and $75 a day is a rather severe one. They had bad burn rate in the gold rush. Uh, very bad burn rate. Uh, and their horses, uh, and they didn't plan right. Um, and, and they didn't know how far they would really have to go. And they, and they overloaded the horses with hundreds and hundreds of pounds of stuff. And uh, in fact, it was so bad that um, most of the horses died before they could get where they were going, and it got renamed the Dead Horse Trail. And the, the um, Canadian Minister of the Interior wrote this at the time, thousands of pack horses lie dead along the way, sometimes in bunches under the cliffs with pack saddles and packs where they've fallen from the rock above, sometimes in tangled masses filling the mud holes and furnishing the only footing for our poor pack animals on the march. 
often I regret to say, exhausted but still alive, a fact we are unaware of until after the miserable wretches turn beneath the hooves of our cavalcade. The eyeless sockets of the pack animals everywhere account for the myriads of ravens along the road. The inhumanity which this trail has been witness to, the heartbreak and suffering which so many have undergone, cannot be imagined. They certainly cannot be described. Um, and, you know, with, without the uh, kind of the smell that would have been accompanied that, we had the same thing on the internet, very bad burn rate calculations. Here's this guy. There are many men in Dawson at the present time who feel keenly disappointed. They've come thousands of miles on a perilous trip, risked life, health, and property, spent months of the most arduous labor a man can perform, and at length, with expectations raised to the highest pitch, have reached the coveted goal only to discover the fact that there is nothing here for them. Um, and that was, of course, the, ver the very common story. Because when you take out that last piece of gold, and they did incredibly f quickly. I mean, the, if, if you look at the 1849 gold rush, the entire American River region, within two years, every stone had been turned. And only that, after that, only big companies who used more sophisticated mining technology started to take gold out of, out of there. So there's, I think, a much better analogy that allows you to be incredibly optimistic. And that analogy is the uh, electric industry. And uh, there's a, there are a lot of similarities between the internet and the electric industry. Um, with the electric industry, you actually have to, one of them is that they're both sort of thin horizontal enabling layers that go across lots of different industries. They're not, you know, it's not a specific thing. Um, but electricity is also very, very broad, so you have to sort of narrow it down. Uh, you know, it can be used as an incredible means of transmitting power, it's an incredible means of coordinating in a very fine-grained way, information flows. There's a bunch of things that are interesting about electricity. And the, 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 the part of the electric revolution that I want to focus on is sort of the golden age of appliances. The killer app that got the world ready for appliances was the light bulb. So the light bulb is what wired the world. And they weren't thinking about appliances when they wired the world. They were really thinking about, they weren't putting electricity into the home they were putting lighting into the home. And, uh, but it really, it got the electricity everywhere. It took a long time. This was a huge, as you would expect, a huge capital build out. They had, all the streets had to be torn up. Uh, this is work going on down in lower Manhattan where uh, they built some of the first electric power generating stations. And they're tearing up all the streets. The Edison Electric Company, which became Edison General Electric, which became General Electric, paid for all of this digging up of the streets. It was incredibly expensive. Uh, and, uh, but, but that is not the, uh, and, and that's not the part that's really most similar to the web, because remember the web got to stand on top of all this heavy infrastructure that had been put in place because of the long distance phone network. So all of the cabling and all the heavy infrastructure, I'm going back now to sort of the explosive part of the web in 1994 when it was growing 2300% a year. How could it grow 2300% a year in 1994 when people weren't really investing in the web? Uh, well, it was because that heavy infrastructure had already been laid down. So the light bulb laid down the heavy infrastructure and then home appliances started coming into being. And this was huge. The first one was the electric fan. This is the 1890 electric fan. And the, and the um, appliances, the golden age of appliances really lasts, you can sort of, it depends on how you want to measure, but it's anywhere from 40 to 60 years. It goes on a long time, starts about 1890. And the electric fan was a big success. Uh, the uh, electric iron, also very big. By the way, this is the beginning of the asbestos lawsuit. This is the first vacuum cleaner, the 1905 Skinner vacuum from the Hoover Company. Um, and uh, th this one weighed 92 pounds and um, <laughs> took two people to operate. This was truly, truly an early adopter product, uh, the 1905 Skinner vacuum. But three years later, by 1908, it weighed 40 pounds. Not all these things were highly successful. This is the electric tie press, which never really did catch on. People, I guess, decided that they would not wrinkle their ties. These never really caught on either. The uh, electric shoe warmer and dryer, never a big seller. This came in like six different colors. I don't, I don't know why. Um, but I thought, you know, sometimes it's just not the right time for an invention. 
and maybe it's time to give this one a, a, another shot. So I thought we could build a Super Bowl ad for this, but we'd need the right partner. And I thought that really, to give that another shot. Now the toaster was huge because they used to make toast on open fires and um, it took a lot of time and attention. Now, I want to point out one thing. This, this, uh, this is, it, you guys know what this is. It, I hadn't invented the electric socket yet. So this was, remember they didn't wire the houses for electricity, they wired them for lighting. So your, your appliances would plug in, they would, each room typically had a, a, a light bulb socket at the top and, and you'd plug it in there. In fact, if you've seen the carousel progress at Disney World, you've seen this. Here are the cables coming up into this light fixture. All the appliances plug in there. And uh, you would just unscrew your light bulb if you wanted to plug in an appliance. The next thing that really was a big, big deal was the um, washing machine. Now this was an object of much envy and lust. Everybody wanted one of these electric washing machines. On the left hand side, this was the soapy water and there's a rotor there that this motor is spinning and it would clean your clothes. This is the clean rinse water. So you'd take the clothes out of here, put them in here, and then you'd run the clothes through this electric ringer. And this was a big deal. You'd keep this on your porch. It was a little bit messy um, and kind of a pain and you'd run a long cord into the house. Uh, where you could screw it into your light socket. And that's actually kind of an important point in my presentation because they hadn't invented the off switch. That was to come much later, the off switch on appliances because it didn't make any sense. I mean, you didn't want this thing clogging up a light socket. So, you know, when you were done with it, you unscrewed it. That's what you did. You didn't, you didn't turn it off. And as I said before, they hadn't invented the electric outlet either. So the washing machine was a particularly dangerous device and there are, when you research this there are gruesome uh, descriptions of people getting their hair and clothes caught in these devices and they couldn't yank the cord out because it was screwed into a light socket inside the house and uh, there was no off switch so it wasn't very good. You might think that that was incredibly stupid of our ancestors to be plugging things into a light socket like this. But you know, before I get too far into condemning our ancestors, I thought I'd show you, this is my conference room. It, 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 this is a total kludge if you ask me. First of all, this got installed upside down, this light socket, and so the cord keeps falling out, so I taped it in. Um, this is supposed, it, it, don't even get me started, but that's not the worst one. This is what it looks like under my desk. I took this picture just two days ago. So we really haven't progressed that much since 1908. It's a total, total mess. And uh, you know, we think it's getting better, but have you tried to install 802.11 yourself? <laughs> I challenge you to try. It's very hard. I, I know PhDs in computer science, this process has brought them to tears, absolute tears. Um, and, that's, and that's assuming you already have DSL in your house. Try to get DSL installed in your house. The, the engineers who do it every day can't do it. They have to, um, typically they come three times. And uh, one friend of mine was telling me a story, not only did they ha get there and have to wait, but then they, the, the engineers, when they finally did get there for the third time, they had to call somebody and they were really happy that, um, that the guy had a speakerphone because then they had to wait on hold for an hour to talk to somebody to give them an access code after they got there. So we're not, um, we're not, we're pretty kludgy ourselves. Uh, by the way, DSL is a kludge. I mean, this is twisted pair copper that was never designed for the purpose it's being put to, and, and it's, you know, it's the whole thing. We're, we're very, very primitive. And that's kind of the point because, you know, resilience, if you think of it in terms of the gold rush, then you'd be pretty depressed right now because the last nugget of gold would be gone. But the good thing is with innovation, there isn't last nugget. Every new thing creates two new questions and two new opportunities. And if you believe that, then you believe that where we are, this is what I think, I believe that where we are with the incredible clues, and I haven't even talked about user interfaces on the web, um, but there's so much clues, so much terrible stuff. We are at the 1908 Hurley washing machine stage with the internet. That's where we are. Um, we don't get our hair caught in it, but that's the level of primitiveness of where we are. We're 1908. And if you believe that, then stuff like this doesn't bother you. This is 1996. All the negatives add up to making the online experience not worth the trouble. 1998, Amazon.toast. 
1999, Amazon at Bomb. My mom hates this picture. She, she, um, but you know, if you, if you really do believe that it's the very, very beginning, if you believe it's the 1908 Hurley washing machine, then you're incredibly optimistic. And, and I do think that that's where we are. And I do think there's more innovation ahead of us than there is behind us. Uh, and in 1917, Sears, I want to get this exactly right. This was the advertisement that they um, ran in 1917. It says, use your electricity for more than light. Um, and I think that's where we are. We're very, very early. Thank you very much.